Thank you for the food that you have provided to nourish our minds so that our brain neurons may be quickened to absorb more of your truths. Please send the presence of your Holy Spirit and your angels to give us understanding so that we will know the time of our visitation and what, is our, what our duty is in this time. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, welcome back. I hope you, you are refreshed. Um, how many of us have a clear understanding that um, the judgment of the living group um, began in September 11, 2001? How many of you have understand this and have embraced this truth? Please show by a, your hands up, please. Because this is critical. If we don't have an understanding of 9-11, there are brethren I know here who know this truth and their hands are down. If you believe that the judgment of the living began in 2001, please, your hands up. I'm begging. Because I need to have an idea how many of us do not have understand these truths. Sister, I just want to say some of us, and let me speak for myself. Yeah. I know that and I believe it, but I cannot justify my yeah. faith. So we need, yeah. we need to have an intelligent faith where yeah. we can stand for the defense. Yeah. I this, know that and I believe it, but exactly. I cannot justify it. This is precisely why I'm asking this question, because I realize that some of us here don't even know that the judgment of the living began in 2001, which then means that <laughs> We have two groups here, and to proceed forward without an understanding of this issue might create confusion in the minds of some, and even cause them to go away confused and lose this opportunity to, to come to grips with the fact that the judgment of the living has already been underway 16 years now, and is coming to a close. So, I mean, I didn't intend to go into an in-depth study of the judgment of the living. That was not my intention. My understanding was the people coming to this camp have a basic knowledge of these things. Um, so, I'm not sure how to handle this now. Um, maybe perhaps we should create an opportunity for, for those who don't have this understanding just to come to to speed with this. Hmm. I don't know. Um, okay. Um, let me see if I can incorporate it somewhat. We know that the judgment of the dead began in 1844. All Adventists understand this. Now, I know that fourth generation Adventists don't have this knowledge because um, our history, in fact, the, 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 the structure of the Seventh day Adventist organization is, is kind of denying this history. But if you are here in this meeting, in this summit meeting, even just today, at least that's a basic understanding, and we agree on that. We also agree that, that judgment is in two phases. So when did the judgment of the living begin and when did it end? Or is it still ongoing? The judgment of the dead. Because this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. If judgment is in two phases, when does phase one end? When does phase two begin? You see? And, judge, and, and uh, phase two judgment is, is also in phases. Judgment begins in the house of God. This is the SDA church. So if the judgment of the living began at 9-11, who gets judged first? It's the Seventh-day Adventists. Then the world comes after. Right? Mm. Are we in agreement? Mm. But even in the church, 
Judgment is not haphazard. It begins with the leaders. Then it moves on to the congregation. And the congregation also has two groups. Are we on the same page? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't understand the time of your visitation, you will miss the boat completely. You will think that you're okay when you're not. One of the groups that... The leadership of the SDA church has been bypassed. God is no longer speaking through them. Are we on the same page with that? Because they are not teaching the three angels' message, which is the remedy for sin. It is in this movement that the three angels' message is being taught. So the leadership of the church has been bypassed. Their history. Now we're talking about the body of Adventism. God must judge those that are that have the understanding first before the rest. And if you've been following this truth, then you know the two groups. It's the priests and the Levites. First is the priests that get judged, then the Levites. God is not moving back and forth in the judgment. When he's finished with the dead, he's done with that bit. When he moves on to the living and he goes to the leaders, when he's done with the leaders, he moves on to the next group. He's not going to come back. When, the, when, the, when, the, when probation closes, when the books for the Levites, when the pre, books for the priests are closed, Christ is not going to come back and reopen those books. You understand? So it's critical for us to understand where Christ is in the most holy place and what he is doing. Yes, can I ask, ask something? Sometimes you speak a bit too soft and I don't hear. All right. But okay, that's fine. Um, um, I understand what you're saying eh? about the church, first the leaders, then the priests, then the Levites. I yes. understand that. Right. But to, in my mind, it says to me now, nobody come into the church after 2001 because the, because the judgment started there. So there's no people coming into the SA, SDA church anymore because it's judgments on. People are coming in. Yes. So you must explain that one to me. People are coming into the organization. You must speak louder. People are coming into the church, isn't it? After that. They are coming. After They're now. coming, yeah. There are so many people So here. if these people coming in now that are maybe leaders or that are priests, but the, but the judgment is finished on the leaders now. What happened now to them that come in afterwards? When we talk about the leaders, we are not talking about the individual leaders. We talk about the leadership of the SDA church as a whole. I understand. What right. You're so now the individuals that are coming into the church post 2001 have to quickly come into the understanding of this truth in order for them to um, understand the time of their visitation so that they can make things right with God before probation closes. Probation is still open. It's still open for everyone. You understand? Okay, so but it's probation. going to start closing. When it's not, when it closes on the priest. When it closes on the priests, it's you know closed. Can come in again among the, the priests, priests. Among the priests. This is when we're talking about the priests, it's a group of Adventists that are, that have embraced the truth of 9-11. And they are, they are disciples of 9-11. They understand the judgment of the living began in, uh, in 2001. So there are Adventists who don't know that. They are not aware that judgment began in 2001. But those that have the knowledge are under investigation. Okay, there are people that was outside the church and they come into the church after 2001. Um, and they are leaders or they are priests or they are demons. How does it work now with them if the door is closed, maybe on the priest? The door is not yet closed. No, but I'm saying, because nobody knows when it's closed, eh? mm. No. We don't know. No, but God has given us signs. Just like we know that judgment began, 
There are signs on the timeline that will show you that we have arrived at midnight, midnight cry, uh -huh. Sunday law. So there will be a sign. Yeah, I mean. So no, it's not time that the door closed for the leaders. There will be a sign to show the door closed for the priest. There will be a sign. But you must right. be in the church to know that. You, you need to know that truth. Of course, if you're not in this church, you don't know these things. Yeah. Of course, people outside don't know this. That's right. That's why judgment begins in the house of God, where the, the church is the depository so of truth. So what you say is, the, the, the judgment begins by the SDA church. Not all the churches outside. They're part of the world. No, they're part of the world. Although they are sincere children of God. Hmm. Let's, yeah. Although they are sincere children of God, they have their time. Each class has its time slot. This is what I'm trying to demonstrate. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you need to know which time slot you belong to and when it's ending and beginning, beginning and ending. Mm -hmm. okay, right, so, so I am when each Yeah, I am not making comments about individuals, uh -huh. about classes, groups of people within the, the world, in fact, the world at large. Because you've, you've got the church of God, then you've got the world. There are honest people in the world that God is going to reach. Within the church are also groups. So my point is, understand your class and when probation closes for that class so that you get ready before the door shuts. That's, that's precisely why we study the timelines. What marks the judgment, the beginning of the judgment of the living? For those of you that have this knowledge, please help me out. Nine eleven. Okay, nine eleven is the sign, right? How do we know? Yes. Was your hand up? Sorry, I didn't hear. When the angel of Revelation eighteen comes down. Okay. Revelation 18 is fulfilled, yes. verse 1 up to 3. Yes. Why do we say that the angel of Revelation 18 marks the beginning of the judgment of the living? Yes. Acts chapter 3. It explains that before the blotting out of, uh, um, when, when the times of repression come, which is that angel, it explains that uh, the blotting out of sins is going to happen. Right. And before God can blot out sins, he has to judge us. Mm. Yes. Okay? Do we ma are we making the connection? Mm. We're going, you're going to see that when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down, God begins the work of investigation because in Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21, let's read it. It says, Repent therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Does that statement apply to dead or living people? Living people. Living people. And it talks about the, and then proceeds to say, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It say, when the times of refreshing come, you need to <coughs> repent, and be converted and for your sins to be blotted out. So when are the times of refreshing? 9-11. Yes, it is. We've established that 9-11, the angel comes down and, and God is expecting us to repent and be converted when the times of refreshing are, are, are come. So what are those times of refreshing? What do we call that thing? Times of refreshing. La terrain. Isn't the angel of Revelation 18 the latter rain angel? Are you an Adventist? Do you believe that? The angel of Revelation 18 is the so-called fourth angel. And that he come, when, he, when he comes down, the latter rain begins. Okay, let's read from Great Controversy, page 611. What are these times of refreshing? Because sins are blotted out in the times of refreshing, according to Acts 3. Paragraph 1, 611 paragraph, great controversy. The angel who unites with the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth 
with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. That history, 1840 to 1844, was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. We just, show, uh, we just saw yesterday from the presentations regarding the seven thunders that history repeats. Hmm. The Millerite history is going to be repeated by us. Okay? And the key to the Millerite history was 1840 to 1844. This was the time when the first angel who had already arrived in 1798 was empowered. Hmm. And when that angel was empowered, there was a sign. What was the sign? The restraining of Islam. The restraining of Islam. Islam was restrained at the time when God was going to begin to judge the Protestants who were dead or living. living. They were living. The brother showed that yesterday. The testing of the Protestants began in 1840. And it went on up to April 19, 1844. The judgment was ongoing for living Protestants at that time. And when their door shut, the judgment moved on to the living minerals. Uh, is that what you call it? Yes. Protestants first, mm. then minerals. Prote the Protestant churches were God's people in those days. Mm. And the message came to them first, and they were tested first. Whoever has the knowledge gets tested first. Even in this movement, we are among the priests, right? Mm. The judgment goes from one person to the next. The ones who know more get judged first. The ones who know less later. That's how it works with God. And God's ways of working with men are ever the same. They never change. God is not respect our persons. So his people were judged first and their door closed on April 19, 1844. And those that remained were now the Millerites and they were also judged living. Their door closed on October 22. Yeah? Hmm. 22, 1844. Right? Mm. If we are repeating, and the event that marked um, the, the, the beginning of the judgment of the Protestants was the restraint of Islam. It was the sign. By the way, the spirit of prophecy tells us that the Millerites went through this entire experience without realizing they were being tested. But we have the advantage of realizing that we are being tested. We are the final generation. God is love. He's so merciful. If we are repeating this history, eh, what does it tell you? It's going to be the same. It's going to be the same. Which means there's got to be a restraint of Islam. When you see Islam being restrained, that's the sign. That what? Judgment. Judgment has begun for the living. The living. Again. And again, we have two groups here. And this is, when was uh, Islam restrained? Mm. On 9 11. Was Islam restrained on 9 11? Mm. Do you really believe that? Mm. Yesterday, the brother showed us. So it means that judgment began at 9 11 because history is repeating to the very letter. Did an angel come down here? Mm. What angel was that? Revelation 10. Revelation 10 angel. Did an angel come down here? Yes. Which angel? Revelation 18. Revelation 18 angel. This is the famous quote that we all read. We're going to come back to great controversy. But the famous quote that we all read is in Life Sketches, and I think our brother Shantar read it yesterday. For those of you who need to 
have the proof that judgment began at 9-11. It says on page 411, paragraph 5, now comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I have never said. I have said, as I looked at the great buildings going up story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18 verse 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. When the great buildings of New York came down, Revelation 18 was fulfilled. That angel came down. If we, it's, it's a mirror image of the very experience of the Millerites. Mm. They had an angel that came down. This angel of Revelation 10 typified the angel of Revelation 18. This angel had a book in his hand. Why do we say the testing began here? Because that angel had a book in his hand and people had to start eating the book. Mm. Your destiny depended on whether you ate the book or you didn't eat the book. If that angel had the book in his hand, it means the angel of Revelation has a book in his hand, which is supposed to be read. This is Daniel 11, 40 to 45. That's why it is our theme song. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is just the steps, the final steps of modern Rome coming back to power to persecute God's people. So, just as judgment began here for the protestants and closed here, the judgment began for the, for, for, for the living, but it's in two phases. It's a two temple cleansing that we see even in the life of Christ. He cleansed the temple twice, and we see the, 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 the Millerite movement that there was two temple cleansings, so we are also going to have two temple cleansings. First the priests, then the Levites. Let's go back to Great Controversy 6, um, 6 Sorry, where did you read that quotation now? Should I read it? Where did you read that? I know, I know of it, but I... Life sketches, page 411, paragraph 5. I think everybody in Adventism believes and understands that the revelation of... The, 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 the angel of Revelation 18 comes down and that's the latter rain. And the latter rain, now this statement is going to show us, the latter rain is the times of refreshing spoken of in Acts. And Acts is telling us, when the times of refreshing come, what do you need to do? Repent, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So let's continue with Great Controversy 6.11. Oh, one more thing. The reason why I wanted to bring this out is Ellen White tells us in this first paragraph that the Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The glorious manifestation of the power of God is not as we humans expect it to be. In, in, in the broad Adventist circles, we have this imagination that the latter rain when it comes, we're going to start to see miracles, people being healed, resurrected, a kind of a, a feeling, an atmosphere that is hyped up and that we are all going to start to have this feeling and we're going to wake up and start preaching to the whole world and the whole world is going to be converted. <coughs> but actually that's not what God is talking about. The glorious manifestation of the power of God is a revelation of truth. It's a message. It's not a feeling, it's not a wild spiritualistic movement. It's a message that comes to God's people. And the way they respond to that message is the glorious manifestation of the power of God. With those people that receive the message, you can see how God takes them through that message step by step. As they accept one step, he reveals more of that truth until they get to the final point, October 22, 1844. That was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And it happened right before the eyes of the Protestants. But it depended on how they received the present truth for that moment. It is not a wave of spirit. It is a message. That message is designed to purify a people. 
Because the Holy Spirit will never come and occupy a sinful heart. That is why if we are sitting waiting for that feeling or waiting for that, um, actually it is the um, counterfeit. Did somebody say that? Yes. Mm. If you're waiting for that counterfeit to, to, to now empower you and make you go forward in the strength of the Lord, it will never happen. You're going to wake up one day and Christ is coming in the clouds of heaven and you've missed it. Because the glorious manifestation of the power of God is a message. And it is the third angel's message to us. And the third angel's message cannot come on its own. The first and the second have to be repeated. Hmm. So, if we are mirroring the history of the minerals, it means that this message that has been coming in is a glorious manifestation of the power of God. These messages that we are looking at, the seven tunnels, the, history, the repeat of history. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. I'm moving on to paragraph 2. As the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the uprising of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain. This is exactly what I was trying to explain. Just like the former rain came at the day of Pentecost, so the latter rain is also going to come at the end to ripen the seed. What ripens the seed is rain. What makes a seed to sprout out is rain. But also what makes a fruit to ripen is rain. Rain we know represents the latter rain, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And if you read Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 to 2, it tells you that doctrine falls as rain. So it's not some, some manifestation, some hype. It is a message. It's doctrine. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing. You know, the, the rain comes in two phases. The former rain and the latter rain. The Pentecostal movement just after Christ went back up to heaven, that was the former rain, right? He's talking about that former rain. But there is also a latter rain when the gospel message closes. But in every reform movement, there is a former rain and a latter rain. In those times of refreshing, when they come, she has, in this statement, connected it with the latter rain. Because you've got to prove everything. How do you know the refreshing is a latter rain? Great Controversy 611 has just told us latter rain is the times of refreshing. Studying line upon line, that refreshing was noted in Acts 3. And that when that time comes, we are to repent and be converted for our sins to be blotted out. Sins can only be blotted out of your life when you're living. You can only repent when you're living. You cannot repent when you're dead. Hmm. So which means that 9-11, when the angel of Revelation 18 came down, the latter rain came down, started to fall. And the latter rain is the times of refreshing. And the times of refreshing, she has connected it with the glorious manifestation of the power of God in 1840 to 1844. So if we are repeating that history, it's exactly the same experience with us. This is the Sunday law. 1844, October 22, lines up with the Sunday law. The temple cleansings in the Adventist church take place before the Sunday law. Any Adventist, uh, sorry, Adventist that's waiting for the Sunday law to make things right will miss the ball. Isaiah 18, verse 12. What are the times of refreshing? He says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. The refreshing, we've just seen, 
Okay, I'll draw a flow chart later. But we've just seen that the refreshing is the matter of <coughs> And now Isaiah 18, 28 is telling us that the refreshing is the is the rest. Hmm. Jeremiah 6.16. That says the Lord, Jeremiah 6.16. We are studying according to the formula that God has given us. Line upon line. We are not to read the Bible as a novel from Genesis to Revelation. You're going to miss everything. Everybody in the world is reading the Bible as a novel from Genesis to Revelation, year in, year out. And they've never come to a knowledge of the truth. The Bible says, don't, God says, that's not how you read the Bible. You read it line upon line. Here a little, there a little. Making connections is a puzzle. It's a, not a novel, it's a puzzle. You put the pieces together. That's why we started in Revelation 18, and now we are in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is going to tell us what is the rest. How you get the rest. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. How do you find rest? Where do you go to find rest? Where are these old paths? Where do you go to study the old paths? To get rest. That's why the charts are up. God declares the end from the beginning. If you want to know the end of Adventism, Go to the beginning of Adventism. And this is the beginning of Adventism. When you go here, you're going to find the rest, which is the refreshing, which is the latter rain, which brings us to Revelation 18. Which means that when the angel came down, he came down with a book in his hand that you're supposed to eat. And the testing begins. And the judgment begins. I know I have not covered this extensively because it was not my intention. But I hope I've agitated enough for you to go and study about the subject of the judgment of the living. Because if we, have, if we are not in agreement that we are in the time of the judgment of the living, then I cannot proceed with my, with my lectures because they become absolutely useless. They only work if we agree that we are in the day of the judgment of the living. Because then, if we agree, are we in agreement? I know, it, I know that some, we still need to go back and study this issue and really grasp it. But if we are in agreement for now, let me proceed because we are going to, to now see what is our duty during the judgment of the living. On the day of the great day of atonement during ancient Israel, on that day of, of, of atonement, they had special duties to perform. And there are a type of our duties to perform today. So I want us to go through those. Because that's where now my health message is going to emerge. Our duty in the Day of Atonement. Their duty then was threefold. And you're going to find this in, Le in Leviticus 23. But looking specifically at uh, verse 29 and verse 30. It was... Um, so the first thing we need to note, if we agree that in the day of the judgment of the living, first thing you need to note before you even begin the work of overcoming is in Leviticus 23, verse 29 and 30. It's just that they are written. And it says, For whatsoever souls did I read that correctly? Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. So. Whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, 
The same soul will I destroy from among his people. The first thing you need to understand, the work of the judgment of the living is an individual work. You don't do it for me, I don't do it for you. Husband does not do it for wife, wife does not do it for husband. Parent does not do it for child, even my child has to do his own individual work. Because then we get into this group thinking, and think that we're going, as long as I'm aligning myself with these people, I shall be fine and I don't have to do any in-depth study. Every one of us here has to come to grips with these truths for themselves. Whatever I'm saying here is speculation until you have searched it out for yourself and come to the same conclusion. We don't have to worry. God does not, is not a God of confusion. As he leads you, so will he lead another person to the same point. But he knows where we individually are. He knows the trials we've gone through. He knows our backgrounds. He knows our disobediences and our rebellions. So not all of us are approached in exactly the same manner, but the end will be the same, that we are all going to mirror the very image of Christ. Amen. But individually. It's an individual work. Stop looking at the next person. There are some of you here looking at me as a standard. You're going to fall. I'm going to take you nowhere. You look to Christ. I am pointing you to Christ. He is the perfect example. And I myself should be looking at him. Because then we end up criticizing and breaking down each other. It's not necessary in this work of atonement. Our judgment is about to close. We need to take eyes away from each other and start criticizing each other about what we are not doing right or doing wrong. This is not our work. It is an individual duty. The second thing is, oh, actually, let me read this statement from um, The Cross and His Shadow, Stephen Haskell, Special Requirements. God requires special service of his people now. They are to live while their cases are being decided in heaven. And Satan brings to bear upon the last generation, which are weaker physically than any previous generation, all the wisdom he has gained in 6,000 years warfare. It is the opposite. Satan has 6,000 years of experience. But you are at the end. You have been born in the last generation of these 6,000 years with all the burden of all the sins of your ancestors right on top of your head. And you are the very generation where God is going to get 144,000 people that are perfect like Christ is. It is the glorious manifestation of the power of God. He is ability to take the weakest vessel and turn it into a powerful tool that will represent him in this world. So you're wrestling against a power that is impossible for you. First step to realize is that you can't beat Satan. He's too big for you. In terms of experience, there are just some things you need to realize. Experience comes with age. You know, there's, uh, even I can't run away from that. I might be a, not a very intelligent person, but experience will put me at an advantage to somebody who's younger than me. And Satan has 6,000 years of experience of making people to sin and fall. People like Abraham, like David, people that we hold in high esteem, that he has worked with and caused them to sin. So what about us 6,000 years later? We are physically smaller, our brains are physically you know, less capable, and yet God needs to do this kind of work. That's why it's an individual work. You cannot look at the next person. The minute you look at the next person, you have already failed. Those who in the investigative judgment are accounted worthy will live for a time without a mediator. Their experience will be different from that of any other company that has ever lived upon the earth. There are many reasons why God in his infinite mercy has enjoined special duties upon the last generation. That they might be strongly fortified against the attacks of the enemy. That's what we're going to be discussing. That's the gist of my studies. Fortifying this weak last generation against the forces of the enemy. Whoever does not participate in this work is cut off. So, there are four requirements. You find them in verse 27 and verse 28 of Leviticus 23. 
There are four requirements. To save time, you go read them later. The day of atonement shall be a holy convocation unto you. Number two, you will afflict your souls. Number three, offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And number four, you do no work. The Israelites had to meet those four requirements. They were to meet in a holy conv convocation. They were to afflict their souls on that day. They were to offer an offering and they were to do no work. Okay? Hmm. You got that. What does the holy convocation mean? Hebrews 10, verse 21 to 25. Holy convocation is exactly what we are trying to fulfill right here at this camp. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Which day? The day when your judgment closes. As the day is approaching, you are not to forsake the assembly of, how does she put it, how does he put it? Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. This first requirement is a spiritual thermometer by which every Christian can test his spiritual condition. If he absents himself from the worship of God because he takes no pleasure in it, his spirituality is very low. I'm not going to really labor much on this issue, but we are to meet as often as possible in camp meetings like this to encourage one another and to strengthen one another. It's the first requirement. The second requirement is that we are to afflict our souls. What it means to afflict our souls, forgive me for rushing through this, but because of time, we can read this further. What does it mean to afflict the soul? What does that mean? What did it mean for the Israelites? What did they have to do? Search their heart. Search their heart. Fasting. Fasting, putting away. Why do you search the heart? You search the heart to find something. You're looking for something. Sin. Sin. The first step to come to Christ is to turn your back to the sun. So the first thing you need to do is to search your heart. So you can see it's an individual work. I cannot search your heart. You can search mine. And for the purpose of putting away sin. And prayer. By the way, on that day of atonement, anyone that was found with, that, with sin was cut off. It means that in this time period that we are in, the day, the great day of atonement, when we, our cases are before God, we are to put away sin. Sin must not be found. Some of us are waiting for the shut door. Chapter is too late, brethren. Now is when you need to be putting away sin. As of 2001, we were supposed to have been putting away sin. How far are you in that work? Have we begun the work? Prayer and fasting. What is the fasting all about? That means since 2001, we're not supposed to be eating. What does fasting represent? Sorry, sister. Thank you. You're right. It's not complicated. Complete control of the appetite. Mm -hmm. Appetite is not only about food. God designs that his people shall be masters of their appetite. Remember, we are the weakest generation. God is empowering us to overcome, to do this feat, to perform an impossible feat. So he says this is how you do it. First, meet with fellow brethren. To, it's, it's, it's like a thermometer. You gauge yourself where you're standing with others. And then she, he, she says, he says, complete control of the appetite. This is how we will overcome the enemy. Keep 
keeping the body completely under subjection. Your body should not tell you what to do. You tell your body what to do. So we shouldn't be hearing things like, I feel like eating. I feel like going. I feel like talking to so and so. No. We must be governed by principle. By a thus saith the Lord. If you're thinking a thought in your head, go and check with the word of God. Is that the way Christ would do it? It's not about you. If you're professing to be a Christian, it's not about you. This is not about you. The great controversy is about Christ and his reputation and his character that is under attack. So as professors of Christianity and followers of Christ, we want to align ourselves with him. You can, we, can't, we can't be midway in between and doing our own will. Is your will in line with the will of God at every step? Because on the whole day of atonement, you're supposed to have put sin away. Yes, in the day of atonement, you could still, sinners could still come with their, with their sheep. They could still come and have their sheep slaughtered and repent. But when the door closes, you can no longer do that. Right. So this is the day of preparation we're talking about here. And what we have is required of us in the day of, of preparation. Fasting is simply complete control of the appetite, including the appetite of procreation. Brethren, those of you who are married, you need to understand that the activity of procreation is very expensive. It can cost you your salvation. You need to be temperate in everything. You need to stop abusing God's body and God's temple. That activity of procreation costs the body huge amounts of zinc. And that zinc takes a week to recover. In this day of preparation, you need to practice temperance. God designs that his people shall be masters of their appetite and keep under the body. Satan would give loose rein to the appetite and let it control the person. God calls upon his people to be masters of their appetite instead of slaves to it, that they may have a clear mind. See, the target is the mind. You've heard about this cliche, the battle over the mind. You've heard that many places. Yes, Satan is battling for your mind, but Christ wants you to surrender your mind to him. And this is why the appetites are under attack. When you feel like eating something, it's not about your, your taste buds and your tummy. It's about your mind. Wherever that thought is coming from, it's targeting your mind. So we need to start be thinking, if I am eating an article of food, how is it going to affect my mind? Some people make wrong decisions about even the person they get married to because of the food they are eating at that time. It is that critical, the things that you put on your plate. They are literally the difference between you being saved and you being lost. You should always ask yourself, what is this thing that I'm putting in my stomach right now going to do to my frontal lobe? If we never think about that, that's why you find in the, in the world a loose reign of appetite. People are controlled by the appetite. And that's why people are so devastated with disease. That's why marriage is devastated because of lack of control. Even animals do not live the way we humans live today. So God is saying, my people, I want you to have a perfect control over your appetite. That's what fasting is all about. Let's go to the offering. First Thessalonians 5, 23. He desires that the whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be preserved what? Blameless. Not only that, in Hebrews, uh, no, that's Romans. Romans 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In this day of preparation, 
you're wanting to prepare an acceptable body to Christ. Your whole body, your soul, and your spirit. You need to prepare it to be perfect, to present it to Christ. Because here at the midnight cry, God is lifting up an ensign before the world to show the world how people are when they keep his law. Now, how can you have a group of people here who have hypertension and diabetes and disease? <laughs> so tired, they can't move up a mountain. This thing is not just about the fact that we're going to have to escape into the mountains and you might have to climb a steep rock. You gotta be strong. You gotta be of a strong constitution to climb a mountain. But also that, God should, the world should see a people who are perfectly healthy, Elderly people with perfect minds. In the world, the older person gets it's a downward trend to dementia. Actually, with God, we are supposed to be, as you grow older, your, your brain work is supposed to be getting sharper and sharper. Your memory is supposed to be quick, just like that. Because you've got all this information, and you've got all this background, and all these experiences. When your memory is fading, of what good is that to anyone? So, God, as the world is moving in one direction, God should demonstrate to people that are moving the opposite direction. Elderly Adventists with sharp minds, who can actually recall all these factors, and facts and dates and events. That's why in this movement, it's, it's about having a notebook and a pen. You cannot be in this movement that you don't have a notebook. By this time, you guys should have books and books and books of writing notes and notes and notes you've been writing. Because this is a school. This is not a church. And you should be able to memorize all those facts and put them all together. Because you're going to have to stand before the courts here, here, and here to give an explanation for what you believe. It should have nothing to do with age. This message is is perfect because it appeals to the elderly, it appeals to the children, it appeals to the middle, middle people. And all of us should be able to give a, a reason for our hope. I want to give you a beautiful statement I found in 4MR235 about Christ. He's our perfect example in all things. He says Jesus was 30 years old before he entered his public ministry. The period of his childhood and youth was one of comparative obscurity. So he was hidden. Hidden, preparing, right? But it was of the highest importance. That period of hiding. Those of us who understand this line, you know that this is the, the period of the, of the hiding. But the hiding is not for, uh, for, for no purpose at all. It is actually a critical moment. It says that he was in this obscurity laying the foundation of a sound constitution huh? he was laying the foundation of a sound constitution what does that mean and those are signs of my waning mind vigorous mind i love this statement this is why we are in the time of preparation we are to develop a sound constitution and a vigorous mind. You know why? On that last day when Christ was arrested, Christ was <coughs> arrested at midnight. He had just been to a last supper. He had just been through the Gethsemane experience, which was a horror experience with him because that is the that is the place where he sat down and thought, do I really want to do this? Literally, yours and my destiny were hanging on that moment when Christ was in Gethsemane. Because had he failed, we wouldn't be here talking and having a hope of eternal life. There is nothing in this life that is more important than winning heaven. You might have a big career, you might have a wonderful marriage, you might have a beautiful life here on this earth, but at the end of the day, when Christ is coming in the clouds of heaven, nothing will be more important than being with him, being one with him. 
Everything we are to do, every thought, every action must be directed to the work of overcoming that we may be fitted to be with Christ when he comes. There is nothing more important than eternal life, brethren. Don't let Satan deceive you and cheat you out of your inheritance, which Christ won at such a terrible cost in Gethsemane. Christ gave himself in Gethsemane. The cross was only a manifestation of what happened in Gethsemane. And in Gethsemane, he almost gave up. That experience, imagine yourself. I need you to go and read that chapter. Just imagine yourself going through that experience and sweating blood. You've been ever stressed that you sweat blood. The spirit of prophecy says Christ was so depressed. He was utterly depressed. The thing that was so depressing him was this separation that he could see happening between him and the Father. And this depression, I'm going to show you now what depression can do to the human body. But Christ, after midnight, had to, set, to face seven court hearings in that 24-hour period that followed. He had to face seven court hearings. Has any of you ever appeared in court? He had to face scourgings twice. And he was attacked and nearly killed four times before the cross. And he then eventually was crucified and buried. Do you understand what kind of physical constitution he had to be in to go through that experience? Physically, the body itself, without the body collapsing. You know what physically killed Christ? The heart ruptured. Remember when they pierced him on the side too? streams flow out, blood and water, is because of the anguish that he went through for you and me. The heart literally burst open. Poof! That is what killed Christ. Your sins and my sin. And so he had to go through all those experience. For him to do that, he had to have a strong mental sound constitution. In other words, he doesn't have diabetes, he doesn't have blood pressure, he doesn't have um, uh, what do they call that? Fibromyalgia. This disease that makes a person feel so tired all the time. Tired all the time, no energy. Anemic, he was not anemic. He was scourged at the back and he was bleeding way before Calvary. So if he had been anemic, he wouldn't have made it to Calvary. So we cannot be anemic, brethren. You know what that means? Having low iron in your blood. Your iron must be normal. Because if your iron is not normal, you can't even trust your brain cells to do the right thing because it means they are not receiving enough oxygen. I have to end here. But I'll just end with say, just talking about the utter effects of sadness on the mind and the body. Um, obviously, Christ had to be of a big, very vigorous mind to withstand the... the, the, the the situation that he was in, which is also, you know, an image of what we are going to face. Not exactly to the extent that Christ experienced it, of course. But sadness can do this to you. Just think about the fact that you might be sad right now. You might have an issue in your life that is bearing you down. Sadness shortens life. Sadness causes joint pains. Sadness causes headaches. It triggers a stress hormone called cortisol that can cause diabetes and high blood pressure, even cancer. It can cause sleeping problems. Sadness can cause inability to concentrate, memory problems, and difficulty making decisions. It can also cause stomach cramps and other things. But the most important one I wanted to us to consider is the effects on the mind. You, will not tr you cannot trust your mind to make right decisions if you're sad. But you know, these are the things that we now need to bring into consideration in preparation time. To see how it is that God expects us to follow his instructions regarding health and lifestyle because he wants us to be of a sound constitution and of a vigorous mind. 
Not only for us to be sealed, but to get through that time period that comes after the sealing. And also so that we can make right decisions right now to enable us to overcome sin. Because sin must be done away with before the door, the, 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 the door shuts. Let's go. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you again for being with us through this one hour. I know that it was taxing and some people were tired and dozing. But I pray, Lord, that you will quicken us and awaken us and help us to recognize what it is that is causing us to wander away in thoughts while your truth is being presented, the truth that is designed to save us, designed to help us to perfect characters that we may be ready to meet you in peace. May you be with us now during the break, quicken us, and, and as we return, that you prepare us for the next message. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And at the time of the end, shall the King of the South push at him? And the King of the North shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots.